Okay. We pretended that this was real, but it really wasn't. It was part of the show. He was here all of the time. And you didn't know it. Welcome to the uh, last lecture in the fall lecture series. The uh, first thing I want to do is have all of us thank the students who put the series together. So let's applaud the student lecture committee. I suppose also we can uh, do an early happy Thanksgiving to everyone. This is, um, in some ways, I think the, uh, actually in a lot of ways, the original idea for Thanksgiving will have something to do with the ideas presented this evening. Not only the honoring of each other, but the honoring of the earth itself, the living earth. Recently, I saw a ceremony, which I had never seen one like this before, at the San Juan Pueblo in, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was there with a friend, Patrick Lannan. In the last harvest festival, is it occurs every four years and the Native Americans who live there, they sing and dance for an entire day as a thanksgiving to Mother Earth. And they dance around a spot in the earth where at the beginning of the growing season they placed the seeds of all of the vegetables, melons and squashes and such, that they offered back to Mother Earth in the same spot. And the dancing and singing around this spot would, went on for the entire day. And it was quite moving to watch that kind of an honoring ceremony, which is much more, um, in some ways, much more tangible, and it's definitely um, a much larger commitment than we tend to show ourselves. Tonight, uh, we have David Abram. I'm going to give you some of the sort of personal facts and then a few other thoughts. He's an ecologist, a philosopher, an anthropologist, and a sleight-of-hand magician, which I'm hoping that we'll see some of that tonight. He was born in Long Island in 1957, so he's a young guy. He began practicing the craft of sleight-of-hand magic in his late teens, and it was this craft that sparked his ongoing fascination with sensory perception. At 19, he began working as a house magician, this was cool, at Alice's Restaurant, the Alice's Restaurant, the one that we all know about. And soon he was performing all over New England. Um, the long uh, bio here is, uh, um, I won't read the entire thing, but he's 
traveled and done a lot and had associations which are quite amazing. Um, he graduated from Wesleyan University in 1980 and immediately afterwards he began traveling as an itinerant magician throughout Southeast Asia, living and studying with indigenous magic practitioners in Indonesia and Nepal. This was a period in which working with these magicians within the surrounding natural world, um, connections began. And upon returning to North America, he began studying natural history and ecology while working as a magician in the United States and Canada. Later, he turned his attention toward articulating the ecological dimensions of human language. In 1993, he received a doctorate in philosophy for his work. And out of that work um, came, I believe, um, this book, The Spell of the Sensuous, which is uh, quite an extraordinary work that incorporates um, um, all that I think he's done in his life. It's a kind of invention of a life and then in turn a kind of document of that life being invented in, uh, in a way that is uh, rare um, to read. Um, what's rare about it is that the book is um, at once it's poetic, um, it's intellectually rigorous, and it's compassionate. And it's written with uh, a kind of uh, compassion that also includes precision, which is, uh, for, for me, quite unusual. Um, he just received this um, year, actually quite recently, um, uh, a literary prize from the Lannan Foundation, um, which some of you may know is um, very near here. Um, the Lannan Foundation is devoted to the visual and literary arts uh, since its founding in 1960. Um, and most recently, um, in the last three years, they've committed themselves to um, a program which I believe is really pioneering to help the indigenous communities of North America um, keep their language alive through what they call the Indigenous Communities Program. Uh, which is chaired by uh, Bill Johnston. The foundation itself is, is uh, headed by Patrick Lannan. It's Bill Johnston who sent me um, this book with a, a wonderful uh, short letter um, that described it as um, a significant work that um, was a must read. Um, as I began reading it, I realized after um, getting through only six pages after an hour or so um, that I was highlighting everything I was reading and um, had to put the highlighter down um, and keep reading it. Um, everything that I was reading, it was one of those situations where um, you think you've thought of that before or you think you might have even said that before. Um, in architecture, it, it, um, the equivalent for me was when I first came upon James Sterling's work, who was able to bring together a lot of things that were happening at the time, but he brought them together and synthesized them in a way that made it very clear um, that they all belong together as opposed to um, being disintegrated. The book, simply stated is about, uh, as I understand it from my reading of it, the nature of perception and language being formed by our sensuous interaction with the animate world, or Gaia. As I said earlier, it's poetic and intellectually rigorous. And I'm trying to um, think of what to say, I decided that in a sort of stream of consciousness I would write how it made me think and feel. Um, 
It explores three aspects of our existence, the physical, the intellectual, and the metaphysical, which through books like this, we're able to use the word consciousness and spiritual. Um, the physical, intellectual, and metaphysical um, are all integrated, and each remains integral in that integration. It also makes me um, quite optimistic in that it, I can see in it the possibility for a contemporary practice coming from the knowledge of ancient wisdom systems, which was a, a period when these systems emerged, when language wasn't written, it was spoken and it was enacted, and space and time were infinite, and humans were embedded in the whole of the universe, interacting and interdependent on each and every other part. The stories spoken and the rituals enacted, described and explained, elaborated an unending system of relations that reminded everyone of right relations being predicated on reciprocity. The principle of reciprocity is at the heart of an economic theory of giveaway that engenders generosity and a social theory that emerges from compassion. The book is about these things possibly existing in the context of our present culture. The book argues for the necessity to become re-enchanted with the earth and the sky once again. It offers itself up as a model of an integration of ecology, philosophy, and sensuous experience into a total intelligence of which a higher consciousness of being emerges. Please welcome David Abram. Hi. Thank you very, very much, Michael. Um, I'm going to actually ask for the lights to come up somewhat um, out here, too, so I'm not just speaking uh, into a cloud of darkness. Um, would that be possible? Yes, we're in the process. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks. Take your time. I'm still gathering my wits from um, being lost in your fair city, your fair foggy city. Um, I was given very wrong directions and then um, finally found my way to something called Beethoven Street, um, which is very long. And uh, then at one point found myself waiting at a light and after a couple of minutes, it occurred to me that this was the longest red light I'd ever waited at. And after another couple of minutes, I realized it was never going to turn green. So I drove through it and kept going and kept going and came to the end of um, Beethoven Street <laughs> before it got to the numbers I was trying to get to. So um, it was, you know, it was kind of it was a bit like the Twilight Zone or something. Um, I'm so pleased I found my way here. A little more up out here, please. Um, okay. So pardon me while I huh, just get these kind of stressed out kinks out of my system. Um, oh, goodness, that was, that was scary. I, if you ever really want to um, pee in your pants, get, you know, scheduled to give a rap in front of a few hundred people and then not be able to find your way there. Um, uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, speak about a number of things. Once I, um, I don't know, feel my way into the environment of this little podium. Um, I think I'll ditch the book for a moment. 
And in terms of magic, um, well, I'm going to reflect on, on perception, tell some stories, reflect some on language as well. And, and try to restrict myself somewhat to the kind of magic that I guess we would call word magic this evening. Really pondering language in a new way. Um, there's a whole bunch of things uh, I'd like to touch on, and I'll, I'll just see what I get to of these things. Let me just perch my watch up here so I don't completely lose track of where I am. I'd like to, to, to open with some words of an old Inuit woman named Nalunjiak. Uh, her words were recorded early in this century by the great Scandinavian explorer Knud Rasmussen. Knud Rasmussen. Um, Nalunjiak was an old uh, Eskimo woman who he came into contact with. And, and uh, one day it was this that, that she said to him. In the very earliest time, when both people and animals lived on Earth. A person could become an animal if she wanted to, and an animal could become a human being. Sometimes they were people, and sometimes animals. And there was no difference. All spoke the same language. That was the time, you see, when words were like magic. A word spoken by chance might have strange consequences. It would suddenly come alive. And what people wanted to happen could happen. All you had to do was say it. Nobody can explain it. That's just the way it was. Humans, it seems to me, are tuned for relationship. The eyes, the skin, the tongue, ears, and nostrils, all are gates where our body receives the nourishment of otherness. This landscape of shadowed voices, these feathered bodies and antlers and tumbling streams, these breathing shapes are our family, the beings with whom we are engaged, with whom we struggle and suffer and celebrate. For the largest part of our species' existence, Humans have negotiated relationships with every aspect of the sensuous surroundings, exchanging possibilities with every flapping form, with each textured surface and shivering entity that we happen to focus upon. All could speak, articulating in gesture and whistle and sigh, a shifting web of meanings that we felt on our skin or inhaled through our nostrils or focused with our listening ears and to which we replied, whether with sounds or through movements or minute shifts of mood. The color of sky, the rush of waves, every aspect of the earthly sensuous could draw us into a relationship fed with curiosity and spiced with danger. Every sound was a voice. Every scrape or blunder was a meeting with thunder, with oak tree, with dragonfly. And from all of these collective relationships, our collective sensibilities were nourished. Now, today, we participate almost exclusively with other humans and with our own human-made technologies. It is, I think, a precarious situation given our age-old reciprocity with the many-voiced landscape. We still need that which is other than ourselves and our own creations. The simple premise of my work is that we are human only in contact and conviviality with what is not human. That we are human only in contact and conviviality with what is not human. Now, 
does such a premise imply that we must renounce all our complex technologies? No, it doesn't. But it does imply that we must renew our acquaintance with the sensuous world in which all our techniques and technologies are rooted without the oxygenating breath of the forests, without the clutch of gravity and the tumbled magic of river rapids, we have no distance from our technologies, no way of assessing their limitations, no way to keep ourselves from turning into our technologies. We need to know the textures, the rhythms and tastes of the bodily world and to distinguish readily between such tastes and those of our own invention. Direct sensuous reality in all its more than human mystery remains the sole solid touchstone for an experiential world now inundated with electronically generated vistas and engineered pleasures only in regular contact with the tangible ground and sky can we learn how to orient and to navigate in the multiple dimensions that now claim us. So I was walking back down from the upper yak pastures to the little Sherpa village where I'd been staying with a, a Sherpa Zankri or, or medicine person. Um, and I noticed on my way back down this boulder jutting out over the steep river gorge. It was a boulder that the Zonkri himself had pointed out to me some days earlier as a place that he went to dance before attempting any particularly difficult cures. And so when I recognized it, well, I stepped out on that boulder myself, not to dance, but just to ponder the pale red and white lichens that are spreading across its surface and to enjoy this sparkling blue Himalayan afternoon. I sat down on the rock, cross-legged, took a coin out of my pocket. In the distance, there were these two condors, lammergeier vultures, against the snow peaks out there, soaring gently in that distance. And this bright blue sky overhead, ringing blue sky, clear as a bell. And I took a coin out just to relax myself, I began this aimless sleight of hand exercise, rolling the coin over the tips of my fingers, letting um, it calm me down. This was an exercise I had taken to practicing in response to the endless flicking of prayer beads by the Sherpa elders. Their, their flicking of prayer beads is always accompanied by a prayer. Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum which loosely translated means, ah, may all sentient beings fall in love with one another. More um, literally translated it would mean, ah, the jewel in the lotus, ah, the jewel in the lotus, ah, the jewel in the lotus. But the esoteric translation would be, ah, the penis in the vagina, ah, the penis in the vagina. But this is the esoteric, the, the cosmic penis in the cosmic vagina that is giving birth to the world at every moment, fertilizing the womb of the mother of the universe at every moment. Ah, but there was no prayer accompanying my point. It rolled over my fingers. Just the breeze, the late afternoon sun, the two condors in the distance, and as I watched, one of those condors began to swerve out from its partner in the distance and begin to head across the gorge, heading in this wide curve until it was heading sort of in my direction. Uh, and when I realized it was heading toward me, I, I stopped rolling the coin and just stared at it. But just at that moment, the condor swung in its path and swerved and headed back toward its partner in the distance. Darn. So I took up the coin again and began rolling it over my fingers, letting its shiny surface, I suppose, reflect the late afternoon sun's rays back into the sky. Because just at that moment, the condor swung out from its partner once again and began soaring across the valley in that wide arc until I noticed again that it was sort of heading toward me and then realized it was 
really headed toward me. Because <laughs> you know, when something is coming straight toward you out of that depth, out of a distance, like that, you know how you don't really see it move. You, you just see it grow. You get the, you know, <laughs> and as the immense size of this being became apparent, I began to hear a humming in my ears, and my skin started to crawl and come alive, like a community of bees all in motion. The creature loomed larger and larger still, and larger yet, until it was there, an immense silhouette hovering just above my head, huge wing feathers rustling as they mastered the breeze. My fingers were frozen, unable to move. The coin dropped out my head fell down the cliff. And then I felt myself pierced by a gaze ten times more lucid than my own. I felt myself stripped naked. I was seen through. I have no idea for how long I was transfixed like this. Only that I felt the breeze whispering past my naked knees and, and the wind rushing in my feathers long after the, the other had departed. And I really had this sensation, feathers that had sprouted from the tops of my legs, from the tops of my arms. And there was this rushing of wind in these feathers, or just in my ears as well, this rushing of wind, my shoulders and my thighs. But there was nothing moving around me. Where was this wind coming from? And then I noticed the guest halfway across the gorge again, on its way toward its partner in the distance. So much of my work today stems from a fascination with perception which itself stems from my art or my craft as a sleight of hand magician. But it really has its, its real origins in these journeys that I began some years ago, traveling as an itinerant magician through various rural parts of Indonesia, of Nepal, of Sri Lanka, and then through various indigenous cultures as well on this continent. But my intent on those journeys was to, my original intent was to study the relation between magic and medicine, between magic and healing in these cultures. I had done some work earlier when I was in England uh, working as a street magician. I'd met the great psychiatrist R.D. Lang and had begun doing some work with him and his community in England called the Philadelphia Association where there were people living with uh, other folks who were in extreme psychological distress. It was a community set up as an alternative to the psychiatric hospital in London, where people could come who were really going through it, but they wouldn't be locked up, they wouldn't be put in straitjackets, they wouldn't be drugged. They would just be allowed to go through whatever it was they were needing to go through. And my, my thought at the time was that perhaps a magician would be able to enter into some kind of, perhaps I could open a more easy communication with some of these folks who were largely incommunicative. Um, some of them were quite catatonic and, and would not speak to anyone there. But in the relation with a magician, with a person who could create his own hallucinations and make them visible for others, people began to open up and speak. And I became very fascinated with the use of magic in healing. And that's what propelled me on this, this journey originally to meet some of the traditional healers in these cultures where I knew magic and medicine had never been separated, had never been pulled apart. Well, my magic was very successful in bringing me into contact with these characters. Uh, in fact, I got in way over my head um, encountering the Dukuns in Indonesia, Zonkris in Nepal. Eventually I was taken into their homes, asked to share and trade secrets with them, to trade magics, and I came to understand everything differently. My world got turned inside out. 
and um, I'm still recovering from it. Um, the first shift in my awareness had to do with, with the recognition that these folks did not see themselves primarily as healers. And remember, that was my intention going there, was to learn about these techniques of curing and healing. But it turned out that the magicians that I came into contact with, who I believe were, were very, very potent uh, practitioners of their craft uh, in Java, in Bali, in the Himalayas, um, among the Sherpa people, uh, the practitioners there were not, well, they were the healers for the villages in their vicinity, but they didn't see their work as healers to be their primary role and function for their communities. They were the medicine people but they saw this, their ability to cure people as a byproduct of their more primary craft, their more primary role. And a clue to this more primary role would be found in the fact that these folks never live in the middle of their village. They're always out at the edge, or they're out among a cluster of wild boulders, or out amid the rice paddies in Indonesia. Um, places where other villagers would not venture at night, but the magicians, the dukuns, live there because they sense their place as at the edge. They saw themselves, first and foremost, as intermediaries, mediating between the human community and the more than human community of beings. Now, by more than human community, I don't mean anything supernatural. I mean simply the community of us humans, but also all of the other walking and crawling beings that inhabit the terrain, but also the flapping peoples and the swimming fishes, but also all the rooted beings, the plant powers that live there. But not just the plants and the other animals, but even the winds and the weather patterns and the stones and the mountains, the rivers, and even a dry riverbed. All of these were seen as living, animate, even sensitive powers to the mind of these traditional people. Everything was alive. Everything animate. I guess that's what animism means, that everything is animate. There's no distinction between animate and inanimate matter. Everything is animate. Everything moves. It's just that some things move much slower than other things, like the stones or the mountains. But everything moves, each thing a being in its own right. And the magicians were simply those folks who were most adept at entering into some kind of a rapport with one of these other shapes of awareness. I'm sure some of you know people like this. Uh, Folks who are just a little too sensitive, a little overly sensitive to hang out just in the human, in the middle of the town all the time, or in the human gang. We pick up too much, we're too porous. And so when someone comes in the room who's depressed, I start feeling depressed. Someone comes in real joyful, these folks just start feeling good without knowing why. These porous folks who are too sensitive to hang out with other humans all the time, but their sensitivity is just right for entering into a relationship with another shape of intelligence, with another kind of nervous system, one that's shaped different from our two-legged and two-armed form. And these are the people who, in a traditional culture, are immediately recognized as intermediaries, as what we would call magicians. Intermediaries because they're able to enter into communication with some of these other beings. And that's their role, and that's their craft. And only by continually monitoring and modulating the relation between the human community and the land are these folks able to heal any particular imbalances that turn up within individuals within the human community. Because they're continually monitoring that larger balance between the village and the natural landscape. They're aware of how to alleviate problems that arise within the village. Imbalances in a particular individual's body 
I can ease it only if I can let that imbalance flow back into the larger system within which the human system is embedded. Um, if a healer was not simultaneously doing this larger work of mediating with the other than human power, of, of tending to the relation between the village and the larger landscape, well, he would heal someone in the village and someone else would fall sick. And then maybe he'd go make sure of that person and someone else would fall sick. Because the source of the illness lies in the relation between the village and the land, between the village and the larger ecology. It's a very different notion of medicine than we're accustomed to in our culture. Okay. In the course of living with these magicians, I began to find my own experience, my own senses beginning to shift and transform. I, I found myself seeing and hearing in a manner I never had before. My exposure to these traditional magicians was shifting my senses, perhaps because I was learning to speak with them in this funny way of assuming everything alive, everything as a form of, of sentience. I began to experience things in that way. I became increasingly susceptible to the solicitations of non-human things. In the course of struggling to decipher a magician's odd gestures or to fathom their constant spoken references to powers unseen and unheard, I began to see and to hear in a manner I never had before. When a magician spoke of a power or presence lingering in the corner of his house, well, I learned to notice the ray of sunlight that was then pouring through a chink in the roof illuminating a whole column of drifting dust. And I needed to refer to something in the house because this, this dukun, the, this sorcerer, is speaking as if we're being visited by a presence. And I couldn't see anything, so I'd pick something like this column of dust illuminated by the light that just then started pouring through the, the roof. And in the course of the conversation, I begin to realize that that was the being he was referring to. It was this visitation by this column of light because the sun had come, up, come out from the clouds above and was slipping through this hole in the roof and now this column of light was influencing the whole mood of the room. It was visiting us. It was changing the whole texture of our conversation. Yes, so I began to enter into this way of speaking. I found myself becoming a student of subtle differences the way a breeze may flutter a single leaf on a whole tree, leaving the other leaves silent and unmoved. Had not that leaf then been brushed by a kind of magic? Or the way the intensity of the sun's heat expresses itself in the precise rhythm of the crickets? Walking along the dirt paths, I learned to slow my pace in order to feel the difference between one nearby hill and the next one, or to taste the presence of a particular field at a certain time of day when as I'd been told by a local dukun, that place had a special power and preferred unique gifts. It was a power communicated to my senses by the way the shadows of the trees fell at that hour and by smells that only then lingered in the tops of the grasses without being wafted away by the wind and by other elements I could only isolate after many days of stopping and listening. And gradually then, other animals began to intercept me in my wanderings, as if some quality in my posture or in the rhythm of my breathing had disarmed their wariness. I would find myself face to face with monkeys and with large lizards that did not slither away when I spoke, but leaned forward in apparent curiosity. In rural Java, I often noticed monkeys accompanying me in the branches overhead, and ravens walked toward me on the road, croaking. While at Pangandaran, a nature preserve on a peninsula jutting out from the south coast of Java, a place of many spirits, I'd been told by the local villagers, I stepped out from a clutch of trees and found myself looking into the face of one of the rare and beautiful bison that exist only on that island. Our eyes locked. When it snorted, I snorted back. When it shifted its shoulders, I shifted my stance. When I tossed my head, it tossed its head. In reply, I found myself caught in a nonverbal conversation with this, this other. 
a gestural duet with which my conscious awareness had very little to do. It was as if my body and its actions was being motivated by a wisdom older than my thinking mind, as though it was held and moved by a logos deeper than words spoken by the other's body and by the trees and the stony ground on which we stood. So, I'm sure many of you who, who do hike or get out into the woods have had this odd experience where you, you, can, you step out into a clearing and you suddenly encounter another being and it is just a surprise to see you and, and, and your eyes lock with this other being. And something passes out of your right eye into its left eye and out of its right eye into your left eye and there's a kind of a circuit that's set up there and then it breaks. And you don't know what happened, except that um, you just, your world changed. Everything is different. Uh, another nervous system just downloaded a bunch of its information into yours or something. It's this tremendous sense of, of encounter, of meeting. And it returns one to oneself in such a vivid and rich way. So in the course of living with these magicians, I found my own sensory experience beginning to transform. I found my encounters with animals, with plants, with insects, becoming a kind of ongoing encounter, an ongoing endless conversations happening with so many different beings. It was so different from any way I, I experienced the world before. And I began to wonder if this way of experiencing it as something alive through and through was not our ordinary human way of perceiving things. If this way of sensing things as animal was our most spontaneous human way of encountering the world. I mean, consider the obvious but easily overlooked fact that the fingers with which we touch, um, well, a piece of wood like this podium, or with which I would touch the bark of, of an oak tree. The fingers with which I touch the bark are themselves tactile things. They have their own textures, their own um, ridges, and their own um, softnesses. And so in touching the tree, I am also feeling myself being touched by the tree. There's this curious reversibility to the senses. In touching the tree, I am also feeling myself touched by this other being. Walking on the ground, it's not just that I'm walking on the earth and feeling the earth beneath my feet, but gosh, it's as though the ground itself is feeling my steps as I'm walking upon it. Again, once I remember my body and that my body and my skin is itself a touchable thing, I realize I'm up against the world, and the world itself is touching me at every moment, the ground feeling my steps. But wait, it's not just the sense of touch. Vision, the eyes with which I look out at the world, these eyes are themselves the very same, these eyes that explore the whole visible landscape are themselves visible, right? They're entirely a part of they're a part of the visible landscape that they explore. They have their own uh, shiny surface and, and their own color, in my case, kind of a, a greenish brown, like the color of a leaf or the bark of that tree or, or, or the blue sky. So when I open my eyes and gaze out at a mountainside, I'm also experiencing my own visibility. I'm experiencing myself as visible. I feel myself seen by that hillside. Again, this reversibility or reciprocity to sensory perception. And that this is our, our most spontaneous, ordinary ways of sensing the things around us is attested by our experience as children, but also by the experience of every indigenous oral culture we know of, from the Lakota to the Warani in the Amazon to the Pintupi in Australia, all of these cultures assume that things 
The things that we sense are also sensitive and sentient and sensing us. That at least is the, um, the thesis that I first want to put forward here is that at the most primordial level of direct sensory experience, we are all animists. To our sensing body, to our senses themselves, we spontaneously experience things as alive, as animate, as sensing us back. But if this is really our ordinary way of feeling things, um, how could we ever have lost it? How could we ever have lost this sense of reciprocity between ourselves and the world, this solidarity between our senses and the sensuous surroundings? We might suspect that it has something to do with language because the ways that we speak have such a profound influence on the things that we see or hear or taste even or smell. The ways we speak have an incredible influence on what we sense. Um, an example, for instance, would be, um, I guess, what I want to say is that there are ways of speaking that really encourage the sensory reciprocity between our body and the flesh, the living flesh of the world. And there are ways of speaking that shut down our senses, that close our eyes, that close our ears to the things of the world. If, if our spontaneous way of feeling the world, of sensing the world, is as, uh, as, is as a living field that is sensing us in our turn, that if we start defining that world as something inert or mechanical or in some way thoroughly determined, then I'm denying my own sensory experience. And so to the extent that I begin to speak in this way of the world as a basically mechanical set of processes, even if it's a very complex set of mechanisms, of nature as a bunch of programmed mechanisms, to the extent that I speak of the things as, in this manner, as mechanical, as determinate, I'm denying my sensory experience and so my eyes begin to shut down, my ears begin to close down. I become kind of deaf to the larger, more than human world. I become sort of blind to it. For instance, if we speak of, um, well, I grew up learning uh, in the educational system I, I went to in Long Island that bird song was pretty, but um, pretty to listen to, but it's, it, doesn't really mean anything because it's basically programmed in their genes. It's programmed in their genes. Um, as, as though the birds were little uh, automatons, little, little robots that had uh, some computer programmer had, had put this program into, their, um, into the nuclei of, of their cells. And that's why they made these sounds. If we grow up thinking that, if we grow up speaking like that, that animals are basically, uh, their behavior is programmed in their genes, then, well, my ears began to, to shut down to the songs of the birds. I mean, I could still hear them as pretty melodies in the background when I tried, but there was no meaning there. It was just automatic sound. There was nothing for my ears to really listen into and to touch and to feel. In that way, language, can close down the senses. I mean, we have this odd idea in our culture that language belongs to us humans and to humans alone. Um, but I wonder if this is not something, uh, an assumption that does a lot of damage um, to our senses and to our perceptual faculties. So I'd like to speak a little bit about um, language um, some reflections on language. But first, I want to start by, with, a, with a brief poem by a Norwegian uh, poet named Thomas Tranströmer, who 
also slips in the direction that I'm trying to gesture towards here. Trent Stromer has a beautiful haiku-like poem that I love, and, and it goes like this. He says, he says, tired of all who come with words, tired of all who come with words, I went to the snow-covered island. The wild does not have words. The unwritten pages spread themselves out in all directions. I come upon the marks of Grovier's hooves in the snow. Language, but no words. It's transformer. Active, living speech is a gesture a vocal gesticulation wherein the meaning of our words is inseparable from the sound, the shape, and the rhythm of those words. Where the meaning is inseparable from the sound. So if anybody doesn't understand the meaning of the words I'm speaking up here, well, just listen to the sound and the rhythm and something ought to get across. Communicative meaning is always in its depths felt. It remains rooted in the sensual dimension of experience, born of the body's native capacity to resonate with other bodies and with the landscape as a whole. Linguistic meaning is not some ideal and bodiless essence that we arbitrarily assign to a physical sound or word and then toss out into the external world. No, rather, meaning sprouts in the very depths of the sensory world, in the heat of meeting, encounter, participation. I mean, we don't, as children, first enter into language by consciously studying the formalities of syntax and grammar or by memorizing the dictionary definitions of words. No, we enter into our language by actively making sounds when we're infants, by crying and pain and laughing and joy, by squealing and babbling and playfully mimicking the surrounding soundscape gradually entering through such mimicry into the specific melodies of the local language, our resonant bodies slowly coming to echo the inflections and accents common to our locale and community. We thus learn our native language not mentally, but bodily. We appropriate new words and phrases first through their affective through their felt tonality and texture, through the way those words feel in the mouth or roll off the tongue. And it is this direct felt significance, the taste of a word or a phrase, the way it influences or modulates our bodies, that provides the fertile polyvalent source for all of the more refined and rarefied meanings which that word may come to have for us. But to suggest, as I'm suggesting here, that linguistic meaning is primarily expressive and gestural and bodily and poetic. And that conventional and denotative meanings, the meanings in the dictionary, are inherently secondary and derivative. This is to renounce the claim that language is an exclusively human property. Because if language is always in its depths physically and sensorially resonant, then language can never be definitively separated from the evident expressiveness of birdsong or the evocative howl of a wolf late at night. The chorus of frogs gurgling in unison at the edge of a pond or the, snar the snarl of a wildcat as it springs upon its prey or the distant honking of Canadian geese veeing south for the winter. All of these reverberate with, with, ac with, with felt, affective, gestural significance, the same significance that vibrates through our own conversations and soliloquies, moving us at times to tears or to anger or to intellectual insights we could never have anticipated. Language as a bodily phenomenon accrues to all expressive bodies, not just to the human. Our own speaking, then, does not set us outside of the animate landscape, but whether or not we're aware of it, inscribes us ever more fully in the landscape's chattering, whispering, soundful depths. 
I mean, I, I hope you're getting a sense of what I'm, I'm, I'm driving at here. If you come upon two human friends, you're walking in the city and you come upon two friends who haven't seen each other in a long time and they just bump into each other. One comes around a corner and the other comes around a corner and they just encounter each other for the first time in many months or even in a, a few years. And if you happen to hear their first words of surprise and greeting and pleasure, you may readily notice, if you pay close enough attention, a tonal, melodic layer of communication beneath the explicit denotative meaning of their words, a rippling rise and fall of their voices in a sort of musical duet, rather like two birds singing to each other. So you got it? These two people, they, they're walking along and they suddenly bump into each other and it sounds something like, ba 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 so each side, each voice, each side of this duet mimes a bit of the other's melody while adding a bit of its own inflection and style. The two voices thus echoing each other, retuning to each other, remembering each other. And it requires only a slight shift in focus to realize that this melodic singing is carrying the bulk of communication in this encounter and that the explicit meanings of their actual words ride on the surface of this depth like waves on the surface of the sea. Now, it's by a complementary shift of attention that you might suddenly come to hear the familiar song of a blackbird or a thrush in a surprisingly new manner, not just as a pleasant melody repeated mechanically, as on a tape player in the background, but as active, meaningful speech. Suddenly, subtle variations in the tone and rhythm of that whistling phrase seem laden with expressive intention, and those two birds singing to each other across the field appear for the first time as attentive, conscious beings, earnestly engaged in the same world that we ourselves engage, yet from an astonishingly different angle and perspective. Moreover, if we allow that spoken meaning remains rooted in gesture and bodily expressiveness, then we'll be unable to restrict our renewed experience of language solely to the animals. As I've already suggested, in the untamed world of direct sensory experience, no phenomenon presents itself as utterly passive or inert. To the sensing body, all things are animate, actively soliciting the participation of our senses or else withdrawing from our focus and repelling our involvement. Things disclose themselves to our immediate perception as vectors, as styles of unfolding, not as finished chunks of matter given once and for all, but as dynamic ways of engaging our senses and modulating our bodies. Each thing Every phenomenon has the power to reach us and to influence us. Every, everything, in other words, is potentially expressive. And so at the most primordial level of sensuous bodily experience, we find ourselves in an expressive, gesturing landscape in a world that speaks. I mean, we regularly talk of howling winds, and of chattering brooks. But these are more than, than mere metaphors because our own languages are continually influenced and nourished by these other voices, by the roar of waterfalls and the thrumming of crickets. It's not by chance that when hiking in the mountains, the words we spontaneously use to describe the surging waters of the nearby river are words like rush, splash, gush, wash. Rush, splash, gush, wash. Because the sound that unites all these words is the same that the water itself chants as it flows between the banks. Rush, gush, wash. If language is not a purely mental phenomenon, but a sensuous bodily activity born of carnal reciprocity and participation, then our discourse, our speaking, has surely been influenced by many gestures, sounds, and rhythms besides those of our single species. Indeed, if human language arises from the perceptual interplay between this body 
and the flesh of the world, then this language I speak belongs to the animate landscape at least as much as it belongs to us. Y'all see what's at stake here? I mean, language belonging to the earth at least as much as it belongs to us. What an odd notion. But what's at stake is, is the question of to what extent are our decisions, our designs, meeting the needs of the land? To what extent are our plans resonating with and meeting what is called for by the land itself, by the ecology, by the more than human terrain that we inhabit? Only to the extent that we're receptive to the land, but we're only receptive, we're only listening to the land. When? When we assume that the land itself speaks. We don't listen if we assume that the land does not speak. This assumption that language belongs as much to, to the earth as it does to us is, is common to all of the indigenous peoples, to the Hopi to the Pueblo peoples where I live in New Mexico, to the Koyakon of central Alaska, or the Lakota of the Plains, or the Iroquois, or the Kayapo and the Warani of the Amazon Basin, or, or the Pintupi and the Pichanchara in Australia, or the Sami people in Scandinavia. To all of these peoples, the coherence of their language is inseparable from the coherence of the surrounding ecology, from the expressive vitality of the earth. It's the animate earth that speaks, and human speech is just one part of that vaster discourse. But if this, as I'm suggesting, is our age-old, ordinary way of experiencing things, if this is the way we always heard the world, how, still, could we have lost it? Same question I was asking before with regard to perception. How could we have lost the sense of things as alive if it is our spontaneous human way of feeling those things? Well, a kind of answer began to dawn on me when I realized that all of these cultures, those cultures that I just named, these are all oral cultures. Oral cultures, that is, cultures without writing or cultures that have unfolded and perpetuated themselves for generation after generation without a formal system of writing. These are what anthropologists tend to call oral cultures. Um, and so I began to wonder, my goodness, what is it that writing does to our senses and to our experience of the sensuous world and to our experience of, of language and meaning? And many, many things began to become clear as I pondered uh, this question. I'll, I'll mention just a couple threads um, before I draw this to some sort of a close so we can open it to, to a wider conversation here. Um, just a couple interesting um, points to bring out. There are many, many, many. But for instance, how many of you have thought about, well, I guess we wouldn't think about it unless we have to for some reason, but the question would be, how does a culture without writing, an oral culture like uh, the Hopi people or like the indigenous native peoples of, of Southern California, how would these cultures have perpetuated themselves and maintained all of their ancestral knowledge, uh, all of their teachings regarding how to live in the land, how to orient through the land, how to harvest certain plants and prepare them, which parts are poisonous, which parts you can eat, um, where to find certain animals, how to get on with each other, how to build. All the knowledge, the survival knowledge of the culture accumulated by one's ancestors, how did they preserve that without writing? Because they didn't have writing. They didn't use writing. How is all that knowledge preserved? Anyone? Songs. Songs and sung stories. Stories. Stories is a big, big part of it. 
the stories, dynamic stories that you tell and you hear and you hear them as you're growing up and you tell them again when you get to be the right age. And sometimes these stories are chanted and are sung at rituals. Parts of the story are sung at every ritual, honoring the new moon, honoring the solstice, honoring the new planting of the corn, honoring the corn breaking up through the soil. The stories, the stories. But the question is, how are the stories remembered? And that's, that's a question that has not been sufficiently pondered until recently. How does an oral culture remember the stories? Everyone has assumed that, well, the stories are remembered because they're just, they're told again and again. And you grow up hearing them, and so by then you remember them and you keep telling them. But some of these stories are not told very often. Some of them, the best of them are told every year. Many of them are told in cycles that only repeat themselves every three years, every four years, every six or seven years. How are these stories then remembered so precisely? And the answer is that the stories are remembered because they are very often associated with particular places where those stories occurred or where the particular events in those stories are supposed to have happened. And when you see those places, you remember those stories. So that my friend Gary Snyder visiting Australia, and he's traveling through the Australian outback with an old Aborigine elder named Grandfather Jimmy. And Grandfather Jimmy is driving Gary in a pickup truck. And uh, while he's driving Gary through the uh, Australian desert, he's also telling him some stories, like about um, the Wallaby women who over there met up with some of the green ant men, and then they had a very strange altercation, and very odd things happened, and so the green ant men had to run up there to the top of the hill where they bumped into the kangaroo people. Brrr, he's telling the story so fast, and then there was some fornication that happened, very strange, and so they were telling the story so fast that Snyder can't keep up. My friend just didn't know what to do. Slow down, he wanted to slow down so he could follow the story until he realizes, aha, that the stories were meant to be told while walking. But they're riding through the outback in a pickup truck. <laughs> and so they're passing all of the sites where those stories happen much more quickly. So you have to tell them very fast. The intimacy between language and the land in an oral culture is so intense that you have to pace the speed of your telling to the speed at which you're moving across the land. Um, here's another example of something uh, similar also in Australia uh, that I came upon that is so lovely. It's also an old Aboriginal man. He's not driving this time, but um, He's speaking as they're driving, and a, an Australian poet named Billy Marshall Stone King wrote down his words. This old man says, See there? That tree is a digging stick left by the giant woman who was looking for honey ants. That rock a dingo's nose. There on that mountain is the footprint left by Changara on his way to Ulambura. Here, the rock hole of Warnampi, very dangerous. And the cave where the Nyi Nyimin, where the Nyi Nyim women escaped the anger of Marapulpa, the spider? There you can see one that, that Wati Kuchara, the two brothers, they traveled this way. You can see that one of them was tired from too much lovemaking, the mark of his penis dragging on the ground. Here, the bodies of the honey ant men where they crawled from the sand. No, they are not dead. They keep coming from the ground, moving toward the water at Warumpi. It has been like this for many years. The dreaming does not end. It is not like the white man's way. What happened once happens again and again. This is the law. This is the power of the song. Through the singing, we keep everything alive. Through the songs, the land keeps us alive. So that incredible intimacy between the stories that carry the language and that carry, the stories are like the living encyclopedias of the culture. 
all of the information, the ancestral knowledge of the culture is held in these stories, but the stories are held in the land. And so to push an indigenous people out of their land is to push them out of the whole matrix of meaning. Their whole language is held in that land. It's rooted in the places in that land. It's carried in the stories of what happened in that land and why these trees over here look like that. Well, that's because somebody kicked up dust when they went this way, one of the ancestors. And why this, this, this lake is over here, well, that's because one of the totem ancestors urinated there when he passed this way. And um, the stories are held in the places, are held in the land. To push an indigenous people off of their land is to push them out of their mind because their mind is held in the place. All of the meaning and the way that they understand things lives in this relation between their body and the place. One other thing about oral cultures, as opposed to what we take so much for granted, right? Um, I mean, one could speak of the alphabet as sort of the mother of the technologies that we all now um, are engaged with from the telephone, to the computer, to the cars, to the television, to, um, automobile. All of those that I just mentioned were invented in the West. All of these technologies were the inventions of what we call Western civilization. Another way of thinking of Western culture that I find more precise is alphabetic civilization. Western civilization is the culture that has been informed by the alphabet. Peoples without an alphabet, peoples without writing at all. One other very curious thing is that for them, language is speech. It doesn't have a visible written down counterpart. It's, it's active speech, whether it be the speech of birds or of other animals or even the wind blowing through the willows, it's still speech. It's what the body does. And speech for them, human speech, is, is basically shaped breath. Words are shaped breath. We only speak as we're breathing out. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but I can't speak when I'm breathing in. It doesn't work to speak when you're breathing in. But as I breathe out, I shape my breath with my tongue and my teeth, and this shapes the words that slip out into the world. And the assumption of all oral people is that it is the air, the breath, that carries the, my words from over here, over your ears. And that carries your words to my ears. The air, the breath which is continuous with the air out here, with the wind. So that the air, the invisible, this invisible stuff, which again, we all take for granted, right? In, in our culture, we don't speak of the air between you and I, we speak of the empty space between us. There's a lot of empty space in this room. For most indigenous oral or non-writing peoples, it's not empty, it's full. It's rich with things going on. The air is the dwelling place of the spirits. It's, it's where all the meaning in our, in our languages resides. It's where the stories reside when they're not being told and where the, the ancestors' voices live once the people have died, their spirit, their voice is still there in the air. In the air. All this stuff happening in the air. So the Navajo people in the Southwest where I've been living, the Diné, as they speak of themselves, the Diné people, their elders say that the air, which they call Nil, Nilchi, Nilchi. Nilchi means holy wind. And it's their most cosmological principle. It's a kind of monotheism. The Elshi, the holy wind, is what gives everything life and breath and awareness and the ability to speak. And you can't see the air, so it's very mysterious. That's why it has this incredible, mysterious, magical kind of aspect to it because it's invisible, but you can feel it. You can feel it on your skin, you can feel it, you can see it moving the trees, moving the clouds. And you can see it by the traces it leaves. It leaves these little spiraling patterns wherever it moves. 
they bloom vortices. So they say that the little spirals in our fingertips are where ten little winds entered into our fingers when we were born. And the spirals in our toe tips are where ten little winds entered into our toes. And the winds in our toe tips hold us to the ground. And the winds in our fingertips hold us to the sky. And that's why we don't fall down when we're walking. But we also have these spirals in the folds of our ears. And, and the Navajo elders say that that's where two little winds are hanging out in our ears. They call them winds children. And when you're thinking thoughts to yourself, when you, you hear yourself speaking to yourself, they say, oh, that's just winds children speaking to you. When you're thinking, that's just these two little winds speaking to you from inside your ears. But these two winds are just kind of subsidiaries of the winds of the four directions, who are themselves subsidiaries of the bad body of the El Chief, the Holy Wind. And so it's a very different notion of thought or of mind. It's a notion of mind not as something that separates us humans from everything else out there, because we've got mind and nothing else is really conscious. But here's a notion of mind as that which connects us in the life. I've been uh, a part of some of the first gatherings of this new discipline called eco-psychology. Um, a, a, a term first coined by Theodore Rozak, and he's drawn together a number of psychologists and ecologists, ecologists to brainstorm a new field. How can we find some common ground between ecologists like myself and psychologists, those who work with people or study the mind and I found these first meetings very, very frustrating because the conversation always centered around the question of how does the world out there, the environment, get into and influence the psyche in the here? How can we begin to speak about and get people to realize that our psyche inside us is influenced by or dependent upon the health of the environment? And this was frustrating because the assumption is still that the psyche is in us. And it seems to me if we really want an echo psychology, why don't we just drop the notion that the psyche is in us? Or we could acknowledge that there's something inward or interior about the mind, about the psyche. But this interiority of the psyche is not because it's inside us, but because we're inside it along with all of the other animals, and the plants, and the trees, and the stones, and the clouds. Why not let the psyche be something a lot like the air, the wind, as it is for the Navajo, and for many other normal people? You know, it sounds nutty for us to say, well, the psyche and the wind, kind of the same thing, what a bizarre notion, until we look at our own words. And we notice that our word spirit comes from the same root as respiration. They share the same Latin root, spiritus, which means a breath or a gust of wind. Even our word psyche itself. The word psyche comes from this ancient Greek word, psyche. Itself, the, the verb is psukane, and it means to breathe or to blow like the wind. And in ancient Greece, a psyche was a breath of air or a gust of wind. That's what psyche means originally. In fact, in virtually every language, if you trace the language back to its oral origins, you find this identity between what we would call the air and what we would call the mind. Awareness, air and awareness. Even such a scientifically respectable word as atmosphere comes from this Sanskrit word many of you have heard of called Atman. Atman, which in Sanskrit is the soul or the psyche in Greek. The soul, but it was the soul that was nothing other than the air, the atmosphere, Atman, atmosphere. So you see, this affinity, this link between air and awareness is very ancient. I want to just close um, with a 
couple paragraphs from the last uh, section of my book. Uh, it's, it's called Turning Inside Out. And uh, it opens with a, a short poem by Raymond Maria Rilke. These are Rilke's words. He says, Ah, not to be cut off. Ah, not to be cut off. Not through the slightest partition shut out from the law of the star. The inner. What is it if not intensified sky hurled through with birds and deep with the winds of homecoming? Ah, not to be cut off, not through the slightest partition shut out from the law of the star. The inner, what is it if not intensified sky, hurled through with birds and deep with the winds of homecoming? Not to be cut off, as Rilke says. And yet we seem today so estranged from the stars, so utterly cut off from the world of hawk, and otter and stone. My work has traced some of the ways whereby the human mind came to renounce its sensuous bearings, isolating itself from the other animals and the animate earth. By writing these pages, I have hoped as well to renew some of those bearings, to begin to recall and reestablish the rootedness of human awareness in the larger ecology. The human mind is not some otherworldly essence that comes to house itself inside our physiology. Rather, it is instilled and provoked by the sensorial field itself, induced by the tensions and participations between the human body and the animate earth. The invisible shapes of smells, rhythms of cricket song, and the movement of shadows all, in a sense, provide the subtle body of our thoughts. Our own reflections, we might say, are a part of the play of light and its reflections. The inner, what is it, if not intensified sky? By acknowledging such links between the inner psychological world and the perceptual terrain that surrounds us, we begin to turn inside out, loosening the psyche from its confinement within a strictly human sphere, freeing sentience to return to the sensible world that contains us. Intelligence is no longer ours alone, but is a property of the earth. We are in it, of it, immersed in its depths. And indeed, each terrain, each ecology, seems to have its own particular intelligence, its unique vernacular of soil and leaf and sky. There's the clincher. Each place its own mind, its own psyche. Oak tree, madrone, Douglas fir, red-tailed hawk, serpentine in the sandstone, a certain scale to the topography, drenching rains in the winter, fog offshore in the summer, salmon surging up the streams, all of these together make up a particular state of mind, a place-specific intelligence shared by all the humans that dwell therein, but also by the coyotes yapping in those valleys, by the bobcats and the ferns, and the spiders, by all beings who live and make their way in that zone. Each place its own mind, each sky its own blue. Thank you. So if any folks want to linger, please do so, and we'll entertain questions for a little while um, and open a conversation about anything that I've spoken of. Any questions? Well then. Yes. Poetry 
Basically, what I, um, the question was, do I find myself writing poetry, and is poetry in some ways a more authentic way of, of using language in a way that relates to the world? Yeah. Um, basically, what I believe is that if we want to find our way into an ecological uh, relation with the land, if we want to find our way back into a right relation with the more than human world, all our speaking has to become poetic. Language has, has to begin to be uh, used with care again. And with care not just to precision, but with care that it be beautiful. That is to say, when we speak, we should not just speak as disembodied minds, speaking to other disembodied minds or intellects, but we should speak as animals, to other animals. That is to say, to other human animals. How can I speak in a way that doesn't sever my felt animal kinship with the rest of the animate earth by speaking, by remembering that I am an animal, a human animal, exquisite animal to be sure, but an animal nonetheless. To speak as an animal, it seems to me, is to speak with a sense of the rhythm, the tone, the song, the texture of one's words, to try to speak to the body, from the body. So that is what has come to be called poetry, but I'm arguing for functional poetry, that we don't just do it writing, writing it in journals we hide in our closets and under the bed, but that we start just speaking this way, speaking this way face to face, taking care, to not use words that are so abstract that they have no relation to the, the ground anymore. Yeah. Does that answer a bit? Mm-hmm. I think it was D.H. Lawrence who spoke of using words that still have soil clinging to their roots. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. Um, any other questions? Yes. Okay. That's a good question. Let me, let me just answer this gentleman's first. I was going to ask Yeah. Yes. Oh, I have a lot of interest in feng shui, um, and in in all of these traditions, which I think one finds on every continent. Um, and I find the notions of the dragon and the, the mist dispersed by the dragon, um, that is amazingly on several different continents and seems to really relate to this uh, sense of the air and the wind as well. Atmospherics as um, very, very central in traditional cultures and particularly in their oral origins because the air is also the breath that is carrying speech. And so any changes within the air, changes to mist, changes to rain, changes to fog or snow, these are changes within the psyche of the land. Tremendous changes within the psyche that moves through us as well. I mean, we imbibe it. I can't think a single thought without drinking this invisible air. So how do I know that my thoughts are mine and not the airs? Um, so this, the primacy of, of, of mist or the ways that the invisible becomes visible. In Australia, they speak of the rainbow snake, the rainbow serpent, when the invisible air suddenly gets this you know, shimmering color arcing across it. And this is the, one of the most feared things in the entire continent of Australia because it's where the invisible potentials are beginning to become visible, where the unconscious is beginning to become conscious. Something is about to manifest. Um, it's this tremendous sense of, of the mind of the world and the changes it goes through, and you see them in the atmospheric changes most particularly. Yeah. Yes. Mm. 
Uh huh. Fully in it. Yes. Right. Why would why would I resort to writing? Yeah. Um, the, oh, good. So the the question was first the obvious question of why um, if I'm uh, so down on writing, why did I write a book? Um, why did I resort to writing, given what I was saying about uh, oral cultures? And also that in my uh, rap up here, the gentleman was saying that he, he found it much more compelling when I was uh, just speaking and moving and when I would begin to read off of a text or scribbled notes that he, uh, he found himself outside of it, more of a spectator looking at me. And so he was wondering, why do I lean on the written word given what I myself have been suggesting about the changes that writing has wrought. Um, I mean, just a tiny one of those changes that I'm afraid I, I skipped over all too rapidly was the fact that when you have all those stories rooted in the land, rooted in particular places in the land, when writing comes into a previously oral culture and the stories get written down, suddenly the places begin to become superfluous. They're no longer necessary to the remembrance of all the oral stories which carry all the meaning in the culture. And so the places begin to be taken for granted. They begin to lose their uh, potency and their, their, their power. Um, writing has a big responsibility for the estrangement from nature that, that many of us are, are grappling with today. And yet, I don't think one can do without it right now. Um, my intent is to find my way back into to, to an oral modality, is to rejuvenate oral culture as thoroughly as I'm able to. Um, but I think one has to do it first, um, not by simply just rejecting the written word and shoving it aside, because it's going to keep going and it's going to keep going on the internet massively. It's going to keep going and perpetuating a very abstract relation to things unless we take up the written word with all of its magic and begin to write our way back into the land and begin to write language back into the land. So let me just say briefly that I don't mean to be demonizing the written word, but rather to be saying that writing itself is a form of magic. I, I want to say this again. As a magician, I have turned in the last few years to word magic as my practice for a time. And I, I deeply believe that writing is one of the most potent magics. That um, It's so potent that I think it has all of us under its spell right now. Um, it's not by chance that the word spell has this uh, double meaning, um, to arrange the letters to uh, spell a word or to cast a spell. because writing originally is experienced as a form of magic, as a spell-casting power. Uh, the one culture that never forgot this sense of the letters as magics in their own right uh, was my own ancestral culture, the, the Hebrew culture. Within um, the Hebrew tradition, the Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical tradition, um, very central to that tradition is the study of the letters as magics, of writing itself as a very intense form of magic. When I say magic, what I mean is, is this. Um, we open the newspaper in the morning and we, we, we focus our eyes on these bits of ink on the page and we hear voices and we see visions and we see events happening in other places and other times. That's magic. Right? You open a book and you focus your eyes on these little bits of ink and you feel yourself addressed. You hear words. It's not that different from a Lakota woman stepping outside and focusing her eyes on a stone and hearing the stone speak. 
we just do it with our own scratches and scripts. It's a very concentrated form of animism, but it is animism nonetheless, as outrageous as a talking stone, right? So we are caught up in a very magical relation to our own signs, to our own scripts. And I think the only way out has to be to take up that magic and release it back into the world. So I'm quite committed to writing as much as I am to, uh, to speaking. I'm committed to writing our way out of writing. But one has to do it by taking up that magic. The same magic that once sparkled for us in the eyes of an otter, you know, and, and, and in the flapping wing of an owl is now held in the power of the letters. I, I very much believe this, even though we all take it so much for granted, we're, we're really under the spell of this thing. And the magic, the enchantment that so many of my ecologist friends uh, bemoan that it's gone, the, the enchantment has flown from the world, I think they're wrong. The magic is still there, it's just hidden where we don't notice it. It's hidden in our relation to our own signs, to our own scripts, to our writing, to the written word on the street signs, and in the newspapers, and to all the other media that now grip us, to our technologies. This relation we have to our own creations is a kind of short circuit of the relation our senses spontaneously once had with the whole of the sensuous surroundings. One has to take up the magic where it's now locked in relation to writing and to these other technologies and begin to open it outward from there. That's at least how I see it. So that's why I'm engaged in writing as well as in storytelling and poetics. And also because um, I'm a, you know, I grew up uh, learning to read and write and so I'm a creature of this uh, weird magic, and I can't just shake it off. I have to carefully work my way out of it. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, was suggesting that this in some ways also is, is perhaps the answer to the question of what this has to do with architecture. Um, if we exchange writing for the kinds of technologies we are engaged in as designers and as architects, um, another indirect answer to the question of what this has to do with architecture is just simply well, I, I guess I would ask, really, what does it have to do with design? What does it have to do with architecture and with planning? To me, it has a tremendous amount to do with it, but it's in all sorts of implicit ways. What I'm trying to suggest is that we really do not uh, respond rightly to the things around us. And particularly, we don't really respond rightly to the land, to the more than human context of our own endeavors, until we begin to acknowledge each thing as an active agency. Not just us humans as subjects and everything else objects, but every object a subject in its own right the walls of the building, the ground on which the building is being built, the winds that blow through that terrain, the sunlight, a power, the moonlight, a power, gravity, a tremendous power, the great power of, of this affinity between my flesh and the flesh of the world that we call gravity, this affinity. Um, to acknowledge these as beings, as agencies, and so to ask them what they are asking of us when we design a building for a new site, to ask the place what it asks of us, to be listening even when we don't ask, simply to be listening even at each step in the building process. What can design itself become a kind of co-creation between me and the land, between us and the place where we're building? 
can culture begin to become appropriate to place again and to places? Um, it won't happen if uh, architects are not taking up a practice like this, it seems to me. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah. Spe speak up so people can hear it. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Sure. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. Of course. But the, the issue that comes to my mind is like, what is that threshold? What is that threshold that we kind of have to identify, either in the class or not? At what point we are kind of like giving in to the inadequate problems, and mm -hmm. to what point we are creating problems rather than solving problems, and at what point. So that's doing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's one that I'm saying that that's, that's one way of doing, it, doing yeah. it. And the other way is like I want to bring all my concerns into my work and working in the environment that I'm working in, is, in this case, is Los Angeles, and do as much as I can and fight as, far, as hard as, as I can to produce the best work I can. Right. So, what is that threshold in, in, in your mind that someone could be? To me, those were both. To, to me, those two choices you spoke of are both viable. They're both real. They're both, I think, choices that could be taken up by good people who are really committed to to helping the world. I mean, to me, so the threshold between those two modalities is one of uh, temperament in some ways. I just think it's. It's absolutely necessary that there be some people taking up architecture as currently practice because this build, the building of these buildings is going to keep going on. So how can we begin to nudge into a more uh, reciprocal relation with the rest of, of, of a more than human context? I, for me, the threshold in my work, I mean, even when I'm writing, I'm actually trying to write, you know, I mean, I'm very far away from this, but I try to write so that if another animal was walking through while I was reading aloud, he or she might be able to pick up some of the meaning just from the sound of the words. So that's my practice as kind of a beginning writer, to try to write so that there is a scrumptiousness or there is a rhythm and a texture and a tactility to the words so that I'm beginning to learn what it is to speak again with resonance and richness 
and beauty. If I speak in such a way, then I'm speaking in a way that is accessible in some manner or other, not just to the other animals that move through the terrain, but even to the trees. You know, I mean, my, my voice when I'm speaking out in the woods, it's not, it's still felt, it still is, echoes and, and resonates. My own body can resonate these other bodies. Can we begin to find a way of speaking that is true to our existence as critters in a world filled with critters, of which we are one. Uh, in the same way, can I begin to design? Can I practice whatever practice I'm engaged in, but the practice of architecture, it seems to me, is, is, is an extension of language. It's an extension of how, if we're speaking in a way that assumes that everything is inert, everything is dead, where everything is basically mechanical and therefore not really speaking, not really alive, doesn't have any real input then in the way I design, in the way I, I come up with any blueprint. Um, I'm always kind of a spectator looking at the world as something that I'm, it's just sort of the background for me to design things and set them on it. The threshold is where I allow that the world, the ground itself, is, it's a being. It's flesh. My own flesh is entirely part of this flesh. It's, it's life because I'm alive and I'm here and I didn't come from Ganymede. And I didn't come from some metaphysical place outside of space and time. And I wasn't designed and placed here. I grew up out of this body. And if I'm alive, and we're alive, at least, my gosh, this being is alive. At least through us it's alive. And so we have to begin to acknowledge it as, as living. And any aspect of it, as living. And the grass is our hair. And the trees are our bones, you know. Or the, the, the stones are our skeleton. And um, to see these clear cuts up where I've just been moving to up in the northwest, you, you feel it on your skin. It feels like whole patches of your skin are torn. Um, how can we begin to rediscover this affinity between our body and the land so that it becomes an ongoing conversation in whatever I do, in whatever I practice I'm engaged in, in whatever my work is, I'm not designing myself, even as a good ecological designer, I'm co-designing with the land. I'm listening to the place and letting it tell me. And I'm participating with it. I'm not agreeing with everything that these trees on this side tell me or that these stones or the sunlight they're telling me about. I'm not agreeing with everything. I'm listening. I'm saying, well, what about this? And maybe I make a move. And I put something up there. And maybe it rejects it. Because I just have been setting this on top of an ant tail. And the answer is trying to crawl up well, Okay, I take it away. I try something else. But can't be a dialogue. That's what I'm at. And it seems to me the simple move that ensures that in my own mind is to never has to do with language. And I think language is not just the stuff for a writer or a speaker, it's also the stuff for an artist or architect. Because we all speak, we all use language to communicate. And my practice simply in speaking never to diss another non-human being by speaking of it as something that is less than me or less aware than I am. But just assume that it's other, that its awareness is real different from my awareness, just as your awareness is different from mine. Well, how much different that aspect must be in its experience of things, from my experience. But it's still experience. And therefore, any encounter I have with it is a relationship. And it has to be carefully attended to and negotiated by every relationship. And the same goes for a slab of granite or even a Yeah.
speak of, of a certain kind of self-reflection, and uh, a swallow has the gift of flight, and a pear tree knows how to make pears, which I have no idea how to do it, no human has ever figured out how to make pears out of the flesh of his own flesh. I mean, can we begin to pick up something of the humility that goes with being human? The word human comes from the word humus which means it's soil. And so essential to being human, it seems to me, is humility. But we don't know humility very much anymore. Maybe because you need a sense of humor to be humble. Humor, humus, humble, human. I guess humor keeps us humble, keeps us close to the humans. But, but what is the human thing? You say that we have self-consciousness which separates us from all the other animals. I don't know that that's true. I do know that in this culture, in this time, in this civilization, we are very much caught up in a, in a reflexive relation with ourselves, where we seem to be conscious not so much of the world out there, as we're conscious of ourselves. Now, is that a trait that is really deeply human, or is that a trait of one particular group of humans who have become really forgetful? what the senses are really for, or what thinking is really for, so that we no longer are actually conscious of anything other than ourselves. And our senses are so turned back. We're just reflecting back upon ourselves because we're plugged into what? Not to the trees, not to other critters, but to the computer screen, to the television screen, to the book, to the newspaper, to the radio, to the television. Everything that I'm plugged into is a human creation, or is it not human, or is it a humanly created sphere, so that the human nervous system is currently coupled to human creations, to an entirely, basically we're wandering around inside an extension of our own nervous system. It's a kind of intra-species incest. We are caught up in relation only to ourselves. Is that human? No, I don't think that that is human. That is the self-consciousness that's the problem. The self-consciousness that takes us out of being in reciprocity with other beings. And when, when we lose that reciprocity, we get into this self-reflexive mode, this, this reflection we pride ourselves on and say, we've got self-reflection, the reflective intellect, and that's what makes us different from other animals. I don't think that's true. I think when, when, when the human mind, when intelligence, the nervous system of this shape is really using itself rightly, like it is unable to say that we are separate from all the other hand. It just is unable to make that move. It does assume that we are very different from each of the beings around us. But it feels, it seems to me, very, very much, it speaks in such a way that it Acknowledges also the wondrousness of each of these other entities. Uh, some of them are not very self-conscious, perhaps, but they have incredible awareness of how to be in the moment and be in the present. Like a tree, for instance, the great teachers of presence 
And we go to all our yoga classes to try to learn how to quiet the mind and find ourselves in the present moment chanting our mantras. But tree are the great teachers of this state of mind that we have. You know, it's so hard for us to understand. So, I mean, like people all talk about the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, and, and achieving enlightenment, but they always forget that he was sitting under a tree when he did it, you know. And they leave the tree out of the story or think that, well, the tree didn't really have anything to do with it. Tree, for instance. So these beings have gifts for us, just as we have gifts. But the, we only come into our humanity. We only really come into what is human about us when we stop trying to prove so fucking much that we are different from everything else and we start falling in love outward with everything else. That's when we start really displaying what is unique to ourselves, which is our ability to resonate with everything out there and to celebrate. That's, that's my answer. If that's our nature, why does it happen in the masses? Or you and you and race? If our nature is to resonate, to be resonant in nature, why does it happen, does it happen in the masses? You know, why do we really have such a complex social world? <coughs> social world that you know, we get so much of the United States. Yes, yes. I, basically, that's what I was trying to speak about tonight. Perhaps I was not so successful because uh, it was a complex story. But basically what I was trying to tell is a kind of tale about why I think we are doing this. Not because this is our nature, but because we have slipped into a kind of uh, intercourse with our own sign that is short-circuiting the spontaneous relation that we have with the land. Um, don't forget that for about two million years, we all sapiens existed in a very, very di different relation to nature, to the sky, to the ground, that we've existed in this little, little sliver of time since we've been humans. We're still basically hunting and gatherers in our uh, flesh, in our nervous system. So I don't know why it is that we fell out of that kind of relation, but it does seem to me that uh, we're not uh, doing very well with it. Uh, the Earth is, is not doing very well with it. And psychologically, emotionally, and um, physiologically, we're having a really hard time with it. Um, and I don't for a moment think that it can last uh, you know, for very much longer that we just stay in this kind of incestuous relationship with our own creation. Um, I don't think it's possible. We're going out of our mind quite uh, steadily. Anyway, I thank you all so much for uh, hanging out. So just, I want to let you know that tomorrow night, in the, um, in the spirit of the oral dialogue, David will be uh, in conversation um, in, with a man named Mark Slauka. Um, upstairs in the main seminar room in the fire in the library at 7 o'clock and we invite you to join, the, join us there again. Thank you very much. 7 o'clock.